The next dermatologic condition we will discuss is atopic dermatitis, which is also sometimes more commonly referred to as eczema, even though technically atopic dermatitis is only one form of eczema. Atopic dermatitis, or just dermatitis for short, is a chronic inflammatory skin disease that is characterized by red patches and intense itching. Dermatitis is the most common form of eczema that is observed. Dermatitis is frequently associated with allergic rhinitis, asthma, and food allergy in a process known as atopy or the allergic march as demonstrated in this figure. There's a very characteristic pattern of age of onset of these different conditions where eczema or dermatitis starts first, typically anywhere between birth and six months of age or so. Next to come or to be observed are food allergies, followed around age three by rhinitis and around age seven by asthma. The reason that dermatitis occurs in individuals and some of the reasons for why it is associated with these atopic diseases is a combination of genetics and environmental factors. In terms of genetics, because all of these disease states are associated with high production of the immunoglobulin IgE, Individuals with genetic predisposition to high IgE production are more likely to develop one or more of these conditions. One of the environmental factors that is thought to contribute is what is known as the hygiene hypothesis. And the hygiene hypothesis states that anytime an environment is made too cleanly or very, very clean and sterile, this actually predisposes to the development of the allergic diseases because the body is not able to test out and react to potential allergens repeatedly over time. And so again, to summarize, the hygiene hypothesis says that any environment that is very clean and sterile actually increases risk of developing atopic dermatitis. There are some environmental triggers that can cause the onset of a dermatitis uh, exacerbation. And these would include things like irritants, whether that's clothing or anything that touches the skin, soaps, perfumes, air pollution, stress, and the weather sometimes can predispose to a dermatitis exacerbation. Atopic dermatitis is essentially an allergic reaction that occurs in the skin upper layers. This is also known as a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The initial insult is the uptake of an allergen into the upper layers of the skin and the processing of that allergen by dendritic cells. The reason that allergens are able to penetrate the skin is due to some form of decreased skin barrier function, but it is not clear how this initial step occurs. Once the allergen is processed by dendritic cells, it is prevented to helper T cells where it activates a response mediated primarily by the Th2 subtype of T cells. This expansion and differentiation of Th2 type T cells results in the release of interleukin-4, as well as the significant production of the immunoglobulin IgE by B cells. This IgE then results in sensitization where it crosslinks on the surface of mast cells. And the next time that allergen is introduced, there is the release of mediators of inflammation and significant mast cell stimulation that results in an allergic reaction. As you will see on the next several slides, treatments for atopic dermatitis target some aspect of this process, whether it is the T cell activation, the release of interleukin-4, or the production of IgE. Atopic dermatitis is associated with crusty, scaly skin rashes that are itchy, red, and dry. In a few moments, I will touch specifically on the clinical presentation by age because the clinical presentation does depend on the age group involved. On this slide, what I am demonstrating are some alternate signs and symptoms that can occur in addition to the crusty, itchy, red skin rash. These additional signs and symptoms include eyelid swelling, eyelid hyperpigmentation, 
inflammation of the skin on and around the lips, dry, leathery skin, and the presence of hives and itching in various parts of the body. The location of skin rashes can differ depending on the age of the individual involved. In infants, the dermatitis rash typically first appears on the face, the scalp, or the upper trunk, as evidenced in the top two images here of infants and children. Um, in children, you can, see, you can see thick, leathery, dry skin that can be found um, typically on the flexural folds of the extremities, like behind the knees or in the elbow crease, as shown in the bottom left image. Adults would have a similar pattern, um, as well as some lesions, sometimes on the face and the hands, as shown in the bottom right image. First line treatment for atopic dermatitis are the topical steroids. And so we will start there with hydrocortisone as sort of the prototypical or example topical steroid. Hydrocortisone itself is a low potency corticosteroid and specifically a glucocorticoid. However, um, on the next slide, I will identify additional corticosteroids by potency. All corticosteroids have the same mechanism of action in dermatitis which is to decrease inflammation by reducing that initial um, release of chemical mediators from mast cells. The way that corticosteroids do this is by inducing phospholipase A2 inhibitory proteins and inhibiting the release of arachidonic acid, which leads to a reduction of chemical mediator released by mast cells. The topical steroids come in many different types of topical formulations and their potency does differ depending what formulation they are in. The highest potency topical steroids are ointments, followed by creams, lotions, solutions, gels, and then sprays. Hydrocortisone, as well as other topical steroids, should not be used um, for longer than two weeks at a time, and more product than directed should not be used. The typical amount is either pea size or the amount that fits on the first knuckle of the fingertip. Because the steroids are immunosuppressive, even though they are being applied topically, other immunosuppressants should be avoided when steroids are being used. The primary adverse effects associated with topical steroids have to do with changes to the skin at the site of administration. And these can include things like skin thinning, pigment changes, either increased or decreased pigment, and then also the possibility of delayed wound healing or infection where they are applied because they cause immunosuppression, as well as some irritation as possible. Hydrocortisone is available over the counter in the 0.5% or 1% concentrations. Higher concentrations of hydrocortisone or other more potent corticosteroids are available by prescription only. This graphic illustrates some of the topical steroids that are used for atopic dermatitis in order of potency from lowest to highest. Hydrocortisone is the lowest potency topical steroid, followed by triamcinolone and flucinonide, which are both considered moderate potency topical steroids. Next, you have betamethasone, which is moderate to high potency, and finally, clobetasol, which is a very high potency topical steroid. The higher potency steroid should not be used on areas of thin skin, such as the face or the neck, because the adverse effects can be more severe on those thin skin areas. The next set of drugs are all indicated for atopic dermatitis only when treatment with a steroid has failed. And these include the topical calcineurin inhibitors, um, Crisaberol or Eucrisa, and then Dupilumab or Dupixent, and I will go through each of these individually. The topical calcineurin inhibitors include Tacrolimus or Protopic and Pimecrolimus or Elidel. These are members of the calcineurin inhibitor or sometimes also called immunophilin ligand drug class. This is a group of drugs that binds the intracellular protein FKBP12 which inhibits the function of a protein known as calcineurin. 
The reason this is important for dermatitis pathophysiology is that calcineurin activity is a key step in the synthesis and release of the interleukin IL-2. IL-2 is an interleukin that is centrally involved in T cell activation. By inhibiting calcineurin activity, this decreases IL-2 synthesis and subsequently reduces T cell activation. Both agents are topical, whereas tecrolimus is an ointment, pimecrolimus is a cream. The calcineurin inhibitors are very strong immunosuppressants and other immunosuppressive drugs should be avoided. They are really only indicated for short-term intermittent treatment and should not be used in children younger than two. The main adverse effects are red, burning, itchy skin at the site of administration, and because they are such strong immunosuppressants, they also can lead to the development of a secondary, secondary malignancy or cancer like a lymphoma. As I mentioned earlier, these are indicated for dermatitis only after failing steroid treatment, and therefore they are considered second line. Crisaberol or Eucrisa is also indicated as second line treatment for atopic dermatitis. Crisaberol is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. And the reason that this is relevant for dermatitis pathophysiology is that it is known phosphodiesterase 4 activity is increased in dermatitis. Crisaberol inhibits this enzyme activity. Which, which shifts intracellular signaling pathways away from cyclic AMP signaling pathways and toward protein kinase A or PKA signaling pathways, which have anti-inflammatory effects. This shift to PKA signaling pathways results in an inhibition of the release of interleukins like IL-4 and IL-5, and therefore decreased synthesis and release of IgE immunoglobulin. Crisaberol is available as a topical ointment in a 2% concentration, and the primary adverse effects associated with its use are hypersensitivity or allergic reaction and application site pain. One advantage of crisaberol is that it is non-steroidal, which means that it can be used and is indicated for use in children as young as three months of age. Finally, the last second line treatment for atopic dermatitis is dupilumab or dupixent. Dupilumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody against the interleukin-4 receptor. This results in blockade of both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, which reduces the release of infl these inflammatory cytokines and subsequently decreased production of IgE. Dupilumab is administered as a subcutaneous injection and takes approximately one week to reach peak concentrations. This makes sense given the every other week dosing of dupilumab. In terms of interactions, other immunosuppressants should be avoided because dupilumab is being given systemically and is a very strong immunosuppressant. It can cause, in some cases, a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction, as well as injection site reactions or the presence of anti-drug antibodies that may reduce the effectiveness of dupilumab. Based on what you've learned about atopic dermatitis, take a moment to compare and contrast the condition in an eight-month-old infant and in a seven-year-old child. How might the clinical presentation and treatment strategies differ depending on the age of the patient? Take a photo of the QR code for some videos about dermatitis and dermatitis treatment that may assist you with answering this question.